Hello everyone and a really warm welcome to the Royal College of Nursing webinar this evening. We will be highlighting some of the RCN Continuous Professional Development CPD courses with academic credits. I'm Andrea Child and I'm a professional lead education here at the college and I'm so pleased to be chairing the webinar this evening alongside my colleagues on the panel. Please know this recording is being recorded and you'll receive a copy in the coming weeks. So let's have a walk through the agenda for the webinar this evening. We're going to be highlighting three of the RCN programmes. Chris Perry programme lead is going to be talking about the RCN Infection Prevention and Control programme. Tim Coupland is going to be talking about the Leadership to Improve Physical and Mental Health programme. And finally, Kate Swan will be talking around the Leading Sustainability in Health and Social Care programme. We'll then be joined by Karen Naya, RCN Consultant Coaching Support through the programmes. And we're pleased that Caroline Florat has joined us, sharing her student journey from learning on one of the programmes. We'll then have an opportunity for a question and answer session before I close the webinar at 7pm. Please can you put any questions you have in the Q&A facility on the toolbar, that would be really helpful. And my colleagues on the panel will try and answer some of those through the webinar, but we do have that session at the end to continue that conversation. I'd like to walk you through some of the key aspects of the three programmes we're going to be talking about, but it's really important you know that the programmes are all suitable for any health and social care working environment and for any role across that health and social care environment. It's where you see your CPD need and where you would fit yourself into your own requirements. There are no prerequisites for um, applying to study. So the three programmes all have the same format. You'll be studying for 20 credits through a formative and summative assessment and you'll study at degree or master's level, so level six or seven. Each programme lasts 12 weeks and there'll be taught days on there with co coaching opportunities peppered through those 12 weeks. And you'll be supported by a number of teams, for example, our RCN digital and education teams, the subject experts, and some tutorials from our academic colleagues at Coventry University. I think what's really important here is you'll be able to access the RCN and Coventry Library to support your study and find those resources that you require. I'm really pleased to welcome Chris uh, Perry now, our professional lead for the Infection Prevention and Control Programme. Thanks, Chris. Over to you. OK, thank you, Andrea. Uh, hello, my name's um, Chris Perry and as I've already been introduced, I um, lead the Infection Prevention and Control Programme. I've uh, been involved with this programme from the start and we're now well into double figures, heading towards um, cohort 19 now um, of running this, this programme. And what we aim to do with the Infection Prevention and Control Programme it's to give you the knowledge and the skills that you need to be able to do critical evaluation of the knowledge and evidence that underpins um, our infection control practice and give you the ability to implement local and regional practice Im improvements. Um, so we talk a lot about um, research, we talk a lot about practice, um, you'll do a lot of microbiology. And um, what's really great about this programme is um, that we've had people attending it from so many different backgrounds. So I learn something new every time that we do this programme. Um, we've, we have nurses, we have a lot of allied health professionals that also do this programme. Um, and the current programme that's run at the moment, we've got somebody who's a decontamination lead. So we, we learn from those people because they've got expertise in those particular area. And they come from a wide range of backgrounds, um, hospital, GP, care homes. Um, we've even had somebody from the, the Police National Rehabilitation Centre on one of our previous programmes. And it really is great to discuss the challenges that being in those different areas gives us because then it does help us with our own practice when we can hear from other people. So um, what we'll do in the programme is you will learn how to lead a service improvement project 
Um, and Karen Nayer, who you'll be listening to later, does a really good session for us on demonstrating your value there. And we'll be looking at effectively managing change in the workplace um, and coaching, which again, Karen will talk to you about. So we introduce you to microbiology, uh, key infection prevention practices, uh, which will all help you develop your skills there. Now, the resources that you have available, um, you've already heard from Andrea, the access that you have to these things, but we've got some really great podcasts, lectures, and we've also got an interactive microbiology laboratory where you can go in and you can have a look and you can follow specimens through right from the, the point of where you might want to take a specimen to how they're processed and getting the results back. So a really wide range of, of things that we cover on this, this programme. So a little bit more detail about what we cover. Um, so obviously basic microbiology is a really key part of this. Um, and you may or you may not know that the most common bacteria that was causing infections in the, in the last big prevalence survey that was done in, in 2017 was E. coli. That will probably surprise you because you probably hear a lot more about MRSA and Clostridium difficile and things like that, but it was E. coli causing urinary tract infections. Um, and in long-term care facilities, it was Staph aureus. So that would be um, probably related to people in care homes having wounds and, and that kind of thing. So you will get to hear about some of the things that might surprise you a little bit. We do talk about antimicrobial resistance and that's a key part of this programme as well. Um, and may surprise you, may not surprise you, um, but in the most recent data we've got for that, E. coli would have the highest burden of antibiotic resistance in bloodstream infections. So important pathogen, but also important with the, um, the bacterial resistance there. So we talk about surveillance of infection and why that's important to you. We talk about um, demonstrating value for service improvement, the levels of evidence and how you can critically appraise them. And we talk about evidence-based practice when it comes to hand hygiene and PPE. And it may surprise you to know that the evidence base behind hand hygiene isn't as strong as you may think it is, but it's very difficult to do a randomised controlled trial for um, hand hygiene because nobody would give you ethical approval in the workplace if you wanted to, um, to try and um, randomise people to you either washing your hands or not washing your hands. Uh, we do some work on outbreaks, we look at incident management and we do some uh, some stuff about assurance and regulation for infection prevention and control and give you some tips about how you can lead in your in your day to day work around um, infection prevention. Uh, it, there are implications if we don't get infection prevention and control right. Uh, and we'll tell you about some of these, but I'm just going to give you a little taster of some of this. Uh, there was a dentist in 2016 who got struck off for poor infection control practice and 4,526 dental patients had to be tested for hepatitis C. A, only a small number were found positive, but who would think that one practitioner could have that level of impact by poor infection control practice? Um, and a nursing home, uh, a, a few years, probably about four or five years ago now, was fined £1.5 million for not controlling Legionella. And uh, a, a, a gentleman in the, the care home actually died. So you know, huge financial implications and mortality implications if we get it wrong. Um, and the Care Quality Commission suspended a licence from a private ambulance service because their vehicles were dirty and they didn't have the right protective clothing that they needed. So that's why you should come on this infection prevention and control programme, because if you get it right, it's good for your colleagues, for the people that you work with, for the people that you're caring for and for yourself. If we get it wrong, it can have disastrous consequences. Now, one of the key things that we'll be talking to you about when you uh, when you come on the programme is the chain of infection and the six elements. So that's about how infection spreads from person to person, 
and how by looking at the six elements of the chain, like the reservoir, how it gets out of a person to somewhere else, how it transmits, how it gets into somebody, um, and then um, how it interacts with that person. So for example, have they been immunized or not? And what we'll do is we'll be looking at how you break that chain so that you don't end up in that position that I've talked about, the, uh, like the ambulance service or the dentist or the care home. So the chain of infection is the basis behind which we do all this. At the end of this, you will know how to break the chain of infection for a wide number of infections like Salmonella, Scabies, Candida aureus. You'll have had a chance to chat and discuss this with your colleagues. You'll have a chance to do your service improvement projects about something that's important to you in your workplace. Um, you'll have met a lot of nice people and you will know a lot more about infection prevention and control. So that's a little taster for you uh, about what you can expect from the infection prevention and control program. I'm now going to hand you over to Tim Coopland, who's going to talk to you about the program for leading, improving uh, physical and mental health. Thanks, Tim. Uh, hello uh, everybody and welcome and I'm really pleased to introduce this program to you. My name is Tim Coopland, I'm a mental health nurse and I also provide, uh, I'm also an expert lead for the Royal College of Nursing on this term called parity of esteem. Parity of esteem broadly means providing um, equal um, resources, uh, training and development for mental and physical health. Um, and this term has been used um, broadly over the last decade or so to describe um, the need to address inequalities in mental and physical health. Um, and so what we're going to be doing, um, just very briefly, is I'm going to be introducing you to this programme and telling you a little bit more about it. Um, we're, um, we're, we're not 19 cohorts in, we're um, two cohorts in and we're currently recruiting for the third, fourth and fifth cohort. But we're, but we're really pleased with the uptake of the programme and the success of the programme because the context of this is quite stark really. And I think it's worthwhile saying before I go into some of the detail around the programme that those with the most serious mental health needs die many years before the rest of the general population. And that's around 15 to 20 years earlier. And very sadly, this gap is widening. Some of the more recent research says it's not improving, particularly within the context of COVID-19. We also know that those that are diagnosed with a serious mental health problem um, also experience a one or more long term condition and they will be in regular contact with physical health services. And then finally, um, in the physical health context, we know that up to 30 percent of those with serious uh, physical health needs will also experience a mental health problem such as anxiety and depression. So with this context, we, we, we know that there is a need to um, provide um, educational support and, um, uh, and a programme to improve the interface between physical and mental health. And I think if whatever capacity you're working in and whatever setting you're working in, um, you know that day to day that you will see that disparity. Um, we uh, undertook a survey five years ago around this, uh, around mental and physical health um, inequality, and we repeated this survey this year. So we have fresh evidence and there is um, a, um, a considerable amount of research to support the inequalities. We had four, four and a half thousand respondents to our um, survey this year, which broadly um, has said that um, um, around two thirds reported that we've been unsuccessful in giving equality or equal attention to physical and mental health within the NHS more widely. Um, there has been some success, um, um, but quite limited. Around 10% of people reported success within local services. Um, and we're really pleased to see some improvements, but there's a lot more to do in terms of training and development, improving resources, but also improving opportunity, which we're giving you here to improve the interface between physical and mental health. So that leads me to the programme, talking a little bit about what you will cover. So in, in addition to the core elements that um, Andrea shared with you at the, at the beginning of the programme, which apply to all of these programmes, we're going to be taking you through um, 
an in-depth look at the term parity of esteem and its application to contemporary nursing practice, but also wider nursing practice across different professions. What does that actually mean in practice? What do we mean by that term? And how can we realistically and pragmatically deliver um, uh, e equal care and attention to physical and mental health, no matter what setting you're in? We'll, um, we'll look at the interface between physical and mental health care, look at what factors underpin that, um, particularly as part of a nurse, um, your nurse-led improvements um, service improvement project. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, um, in this um, in this particular cohort, there are a wide range of service improvement projects. And I'll give you an example of just um, three or four, just to give you an idea and a flavour of what people are working on. So we have people from all settings on the current cohort. Um, one person is doing a trauma-informed approach to cervical screening. Another person is doing a physical education programme, looking at aspects of physical health relating to serious mental illness. Um, somebody else is doing um, a, a phys looking at physical health care within learning disabilities and autism. Um, and then uh, somebody else is doing a, a project to ensure that mental health patients get their mental health medication whilst they're in a general hospital. So what you can see there is that actually people are given an opportunity to really bring this to life and to do something really important to improve the interface, whether that be system-wide, whether that be within their local hospital, or whether that be just um, within their immediate environment. We'll be looking at what impacts the ability to deliver holistic nursing care, and we'll be looking at that in what we call a macro, a miso, um, and um, um, micro level. So we'll be exploring all of those elements, including the system-wide elements, such as social deprivation and social determinants. We'll be looking at NHS systems and how they may be affected and how um, integration is important and the allocation of resources. And then we'll be looking at local systems and what may be happening in local systems that may impact our ability to deliver. But we'll be looking also at what we know is makes a successful interface between mental and physical health. As expected, we will explore some contemporary perspectives. We know that health outcomes for those with the most profound mental health problems has worsened since COVID-19. So we'll be exploring those as part of a contemporary perspective. And, and similar to all of the other programmes, we will be developing an understanding of change management processes. We'll be helping you to work and connect together as a group um, and to consider how, what it may be like to work across um, organisational and professional boundaries. What I've really noticed from the programmes, which I think is quite exciting, is that people come from all parts of the country or all, all four UK nations, and they have an opportunity to spend time together to really share perspectives and to um, and to interact in a very um, in a very helpful way with each other about their experience of improving the interface. So there's a huge amount of learning there as well. Um, which we'll, we'll be learning in a, in a while about the benefits also of coaching and how coaching can really improve and really crystallise the experience of um, improving this interface. But also what we'll be doing is learning from different professionals um, throughout the, th um, the, the course about their perspectives. So perspectives from um, mental health, perspectives from physical health and acute care, perspectives from learning disability and most vitally perspectives from service users. And we have a, we have sessions particularly around service users with um, people um, representing and coming in and sharing their experience of equality and in the interface between mental and physical health. So this is a really exciting programme. I think contextually it is vital that we really work to provide holistic care. Um, this programme um, is has come at a point that it's really needed within the NHS and I would just really encourage you to consider this as part of your own CPD and um, and uh, personal development, but also the potential transformational change that it could bring about within your workplace. So um, that's uh, that's um, the, um, the programme around leadership to improve physical and mental health. I'm now going to hand you over to um, Kate, Kate Swan, who's going to just share with you the third programme this evening, which is leading sustainability in health and social care. Thank you, Tim. 
Um, good evening, everyone. As I say, my name is Kate Swan and I am one of the RCN leads in education. And I also are leading not only the leading sustainability in health and social care, but I'll also work alongside Tim in the um, leading leadership to improve physical and mental health. So this is our very new program uh, like Tim. It's um, only our second cohort started in September and it's really looking around sustainability and how that affects health and social care. Um, we know that this is a very new area within nursing practice and um, it is something that we want to consider because of the social, the environmental and the, the financial impact it has um, on everything that we do. And that also has a knock on effect within the health and social care area. Um, we know that climate change, along with the collapse of biodiversity, um, is one of the biggest health threats that we have today. And that's never, no we can see that today with Storm Kieran coming in with the floods and the high winds that we have just here in the UK, not to mention the effect of climate change on the rest of the environment throughout the world. Um, and health and care services, um, we know that um, we contribute significantly to um, green, greenhouse gas emission. We are absolutely a major um, contributor to that and a major driver for climate change globally. So I think nurses have a very key role now within their jobs, within their organisation um, as a leading role in trying to reduce this greenhouse gas emission. Um, we're aware that our carbon footprint is becoming more and more important and we, and you know, and we do know that trusts and organisations are being challenged to reduce their carbon footprint every day. So that's really what we thought about when we actually began looking at developing a programme to help nurses or, um, within that work within the environment of health and social care. Um, and to see if there's some way that we could help give them the information they need. So by taking part in this programme, we want to learn and lead arguments for patient care based on the science of climate change. And I think that's very important. It's looking at science and the climate change. Um, it's an emergency, not just for you, but also for our patients and for the wider community that we serve which shows the social inequality and the health benefits of climate change, climate action in the workplace um, versus the inequality and the poor health benefits of not doing anything about it. So um, we want to recognise the impact of products and consumables from product life cycle perspective. So what this course is looking at is not just about talking about climate change, um, but getting your organisation and your colleagues within the work to, uh, working environment to talk about climate change, to looking at areas like where does our products come from, procurement, for sustainability and health and care services is very important. Now we have to look at the products of their life cycle and what that carbon footprint is to get that, whatever that piece of, even if it was something as simple as a pair of scissors, how does it get from A to B? And what is that carbon footprint? So carbon footprinting and the mathematics behind it is something that we teach within the course as well. And that allows people to put into perspective how much carbon is actually used for one product. And that is something that you can take forward to organisations to show that there's sometimes better ways to do it. Reform procurement to help achieve sustainability in healthcare. Again, this is very important. We have to look at the reform, and the reform of procurement. So the programme itself has been designed really to equip participants uh, with knowledge and skill with which to plan, lead and deliver healthcare akin to the principles of sustainability. And what we're really looking at is forging the sector's contribution to combating climate change and the promotion of sustainability. And I think as a nursing profession, we must look at our roles and how we can make a difference. And hopefully this programme will give you the tools to be able to do that and to have a voice. Um, and we, uh, the programme will help support persistence really to support you to focus on the practice that you currently do. So it's in the area that you currently practice on and to try to adapt those practices to help combat um, greenhouse gas emission. 
So we have been very lucky in the fact that we have a lot of experts. We have expert speakers that have been very kindly uh, wishing to come on board and to speak to the nurses. So Rupert Reid, who is from Climate Majority Project, he deals with the movement of change. And this is at both local, national and international perspectives on carbon footprinting and the healthcare. So a lot of you may already know Rupert Reid, he's a very big activist in climate change, but we're looking at it from a perspective of health and social care, and how we can improve the health and social care of our patients and the wider community within we that we work in, but also how to get a voice, how to speak to your organisation and how to look at how sustainability needs to be a priority. We also have had David Powell, who's from Climate Outreach, and we've been lucky enough that um, last week he did a live workshop for us on communicating climate change. And I think this is very important. And this is one of the pro one of the areas that we concentrate on during this program. Um, it's really about how do you talk about climate change? How do you communicate to other people without sounding like um, your rights and their wrong? And so we take into account this and we have part of the program, we have what we call a bar stool exercise. So we teach how to talk to people. And it's not really about talking to people, it's about listening to what they think or what they feel and acting upon that. So um, we've been very lucky um, to have David Powell to come on board to help us with that. Within the content, we have coaching and we're going to speak to Karen after this slide um, and we're going to look, we have sustainability and quality improvement, perform procurement to help achieve sustainability in healthcare. We also on this program also have a wonderful um, on um, Sorry, I've lost my train there. We have a, a presentation on demonstrating value, which is exceptional, and obviously leadership, which is very important. Now, we also do a carbon literacy training um, within the programme. So this is built into the programme, and this is um, a programme from the Carbon Literacy Project UK, and it is integrated into this, and it gives you a certificate on top of your certificate from this um, as a carbon literacy, literacy certified, and that allows you to go back to your organisation with another qualification. So the programme itself, like all of the other two programmes, is blended learning and is open to anyone. You know, the programme has been developed to support anyone that's in a role of procurement, um, procurement specialists. We have had um, people from care homes. Um, we've had nurses that are in sustainability supporting roles or just nurses in general who have an interest in it and want to develop more of their skills. Um, we also have had um, interest from GP practice nurses as well. So that's nice to know that it's not just within the acute services. Um, so this can be taken out to the wider community. Um, the programme itself, as I say, like the other three programmes, as Andre has said, can be just offered at, cer at certificate level, but you also have the opportunity to do it at um, degree or master's level at 20 credits at Coventry University. So in whole, as I say, it's a brand new programme and we've been very blessed that we've had two wonderful cohorts to begin with. And um, we're hoping that we will be able to keep going and have as many numbers as the IPC course. Um, but it's a brand new course and we do really hope that people look at it and if are interested to get in touch. So on that note, I am going to hand over to Karen, who's going to tell us all about the wonderful coaching that we also offer throughout all three programmes. Thank you so much, Kay. Good evening, everybody. It's exciting stuff. Um, I'm here to speak with you about the coaching offer that is a really special element of each of these programmes. And I'm wondering who might have had coaching before? If you have had coaching before, please jump in the chat and let us know, say yes or no. What I'm going to take you through this evening is the purpose of coaching within these programmes, a bit about what you might expect to get from it, and also what to expect from the process. How does it work within these programmes? Okay. The most important thing to say about the coaching offer is that coaching is all about you. It's all about 
supporting you to look at areas or issues that you choose to work on. It might be something you're good at already and you want to get even better at or specialise in or do a deeper focus on. That's great. Or it might be looking at things that you found challenging in the past and areas where you want to improve. In any case, coaching is the space and the time with support to help you find your own best way forward in confidence and in a non-judgmental supportive setting. And how often does that happen, huh? I have hundreds and hundreds of hours of experience coaching people from all kinds of roles and backgrounds right across health and social care, from people very early on in their careers to very senior folk and people often who are rejoining the workforce after a break or maybe who haven't done academic study for a while. Coaching is here to support all of you within the programmes. As you've heard, I'm also a specialist in demonstrating value and improvement, so all about evaluation and helping you find your impact. But what matters most is that I am one of the personal coaches for two out of these three programmes. Hopefully you will register and should you do that, you would each have access to up to six hours of one to one individual coaching included across your 12 week programme. Why do we do that? There's coaching built in for a reason. It's to help you achieve what you want to from this learning experience and to help you thrive on it. How might coaching help you? Well, coaching can help you to get clarity and focus and stay organised as you work through these programmes. I and the other coaches can help you to identify ideas you want to work on, to crystallise them and provide support and a sounding board to help you reach your goals. So coaching is there for your personal and professional development and also to support you as you work through your assignments, the formative early assignments and the summative later assignment on which you're assessed. In terms of helping you with personal and professional development, I can, as I say, help you get clarity about what you want from the program, why it matters and what you might do with it later, but also help you focus on areas you might want to develop going forward into your career. And oftentimes people want to look at things like being more assertive, finding their voice in meetings or being able to speak up. Sometimes it's about having difficult or critical conversations with people. How often do we have to deal with that? Or sometimes it might be about raising your profile, increasing your network and expanding your influence. Coaching can support you with all of these across the programmes. And in terms of your assignments, maybe you might come onto your programme with no idea for a service improvement project or where to start. If that's the case, coaching can help you work through and identify some of the best options for you. We can think about some criteria for a successful project. We can absolutely do some reality checking so that it's manageable and deliverable. And you can think then about how to decide which is the best option for you. On the flip side, if you're coming with just too many ideas and a whole wealth of ideas, we can do something similar so that you can crystallise your purpose and really think about the best way forward for you with just one clear option. And of course, coaching can also support you as you work through your assignments and your projects to help keep you focused, to think about the learning outcomes and the expectations of the programme, maybe to help you work through any obstacles, either personal or to do with the programme, and to keep you on track and support you as you deliver and succeed. You decide what you're going to bring to coaching and we will follow that and support you through it. What are some of the other benefits of coaching that people have brought and experienced? Well, some very recent examples of what people have brought have included people returning to study after a long time of not doing any academic work. For those people, coaching can help you to regain your confidence, huh? to write, to write in an academic style, to conduct research and to present ideas. 
And oftentimes that means helping you feel resourceful. Where can you find what you need? How can you get that information? And helping you be clear about the expectations. And of course, coaching can really help people to manage and manage their time and manage their time as they're coming back into study. Time to do that study, to do some reflection and also to make progress. And hey, sometimes that is about how to manage and work with and handle the people around you who you need to support you. Other areas where coaching has, have, has really successfully supported people has been around helping people prioritise when they've got loads of competing ideas. That can be a really, a really useful other use to spend your coaching time. So how do we do that then? What might you expect from coaching? Well, you can always expect that your coaches across this programme, no matter who it would be, is always curious and open when we are coaching you. I use a well-recognized approach. It's called the GROW model. And that model helps you to set your own goals, be realistic about what you do, to work out your best options, and to help you find the will and the drive to take your next steps forward. I'll do that by asking you open and powerful questions to help you develop your thinking and your work. And I also draw on positive psychology evidence and techniques that are going to help you feel resourceful, help you draw on your strengths and have conversations that are focused on outcomes and not feeling stuck. But as I say, you will always decide what we talk about and that will be confidential for us. So you will each have up to six hours of personal coaching. Typically, that takes about 50 to 60 minutes each time across six different sessions. And we'd recommend that you book times well in advance. A couple of weeks apart works really well. If you have a semi-regular pattern for your coaching, that can help keep you focused and moving forward and help you allocate your own time for coaching as well. Very early on, once you start the programme, your coach contacts you directly with their details and how you can choose and book your coaching slots. But we all understand that life happens, so we are flexible and you can change book slots subject to availability. And you can even sometimes decide the platform that is going to be best for you for coaching. I personally use Teams or Google Meet, but I'm really flexible about how that works. So if you've never worked with a coach before, here is your opportunity. And if you have, you'll hopefully know the value of coaching and be keen to get started. My long experience is that this coaching offer within these programmes is a rare and unusual opportunity. And we really urge you to get involved and use that should you take part in a programme. OK. I want to leave you with just one or two things for you to think about. Firstly, I'd love you to jump in the chat and share with us one word that sums up how the idea of coaching feels. How would it feel to have that support and that coaching throughout the programme? Please let us know and I'll have a look at that in a couple of moments. And then quietly just for yourself, just reflect for a second on which areas or issues are you looking to develop? What's important to you right now? And then final question for me, what would be the impact for you and people around you if you developed in those areas? So hopefully that's given you some food for thought and an introduction to coaching. It is my absolute pleasure now to introduce you to Carolyn Florat, who's an alumna from the Leading Sustainability in Health and Social Care programme. Over to you, Carolyn. Thanks, Karen. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm Carolyn Florath, a transformational lead nurse for a community nursing um, teams in the Midlands. Um, and I was very lucky to have coaching with Karen um, during my course, and she's absolutely fabulous. So I would absolutely recommend that course to anyone. Um, so obviously, um, answering the questions um, here, why did I take this course? Um, 
you know, we're, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I worked in the community. I'm a district nurse by background um, and worked, you know, clinically through that with patients and really sort of reflected on um, the amount of waste that we saw in the community from, you know, PPE, you know, all those sort of products we were using that we were disposing of um, and thought really about the impact on the environment that we were having um, as clinicians. Um, so started to read a little bit about sustainability um, you know, what the impact was um, of the health service, um, understanding, you know, the sort of net zero goals um, that were sort of being brought in by the NHS and how we as clinicians had that responsibility really um, to, to try and sort of reduce that. Um, so I just wanted to know a bit more really um, about how we were doing that, about the global impact, um, you know, sort of understand more about how that was impacting on climate change, thinking about some of the, the gases that we were releasing as, an, as the NHS organisation. So, you know, just really wanted to sort of get a better understanding of, of how and why and, and how we could sort of influence change really. Um, so in terms of the benefits for me and, and my organisation, um, I think, you know, doing the course really sort of opened my eyes um, personally and professionally, really. Um, I really sort of looked again at my, my own behaviours, my own clinical practice. Um, thought about you know some of the things that I was doing at home um, in my family you know were we recycling enough were we sort of using you know disposable things you know tin foil and you know and all all that sort of thing that was that was having that impact really um, and thought about you know actually clinically again just how much waste we were producing thought about some of the clinical practice in the community around um, prescribing um, you know sort of inhaler disposal and um, all those sort of things that you know was that we learn on the program and um, that could really sort of impact on um our global footprint um our carbon footprint as an organization um personally and professionally you know it was it was great um sort of a learning opportunity um i did the um, level seven course with coventry university so i received 20 credits uh, once i completed um my um my um, assessment um, that we did. Um, obviously, we had um, the accreditation from the RCN, the certificate there, um, and the carbon literacy training as well. So it really sort of was um, a really good sort of um, learning opportunity, um, but also came with those credits, you know, for your CPD and your revalidation, all that sort of thing that we need as nurses. Um, but it did, you know, again, open up opportunities since doing the course. Um, we the, we were sort of the first participants to do that course. We were invited to come and meet the Green Party um, at, in London um, with the RCM with Rose um, Gallagher. So that was a you know was such an amazing opportunity um, to have um, and just sort of really make those close links with the RCN and, um, and understand a bit more about what the RCN offers. And I already want to do Tim's course, so I'm looking at that already to go and follow up and do because um, it's just brilliant. Sounds brilliant. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just really opened up my sort of um, ideas really around how um, how we practice in our organisation and, um, you know, how we sort of um, as nurses contribute really um, to that. And I think, you know, in terms of, sort, you know, as you know advising you to go and do this program um i absolutely would and and some of that learning was around you know um understanding the net zero goals and and, and the agenda um behind that um within the nhs and i think as part of that i really understood that you know as nurses we're you know one of the biggest workforces in the nhs um, and we are, you know, we have got responsibilities to sort of drive that and we can have the biggest impact. So I would absolutely, you know, really encourage any nurses to go and do, do the programme. 
um, as part of following the programme, I've been involved in two sustainability projects in my organisation. Um, we've set up a green team in our organisation, um, which is sort of clinicians and corporate staff as well. Um, and we have regular meetings, regular discussions about, you know, how we can improve practice. Um, as part of the course, I did a project around inhaler disposals um, because I understood that actually um, we're not disposing of inhalers prop properly. We're over prescribing inhalers. We are, you know, creating gas um, that's impacting our environment. And um, so worked with my um, pharmacy lead in our organisation. We created some posters, some um, promotion, um, working with our pharmacies in the community to really sort of promote and, and, and make sure that everyone understands again their responsibilities around um you know sort of inhalers and and doing some education to our patients um, and with our um, GP partners as well um, with some of the nurses there so it's you know it's been really sort of interesting for me and um, learning more about that really and um, I've also been part of a gardening project and sort of understanding a bit more about the use of the green space and you know um, trying to sort of reduce duplication of care and services so I think it's such a massive entity and you don't realise until until you do the program how much impact you know we could have by being more sustainable as an organization and really how it would improve our practice and the care that we give to our patients and um, I think the biggest sort of learning for me was um, actually thinking about um, you know the sort of changes now that we're facing with the NHS and you know our elderly the population you know we're growing more elderly by the day we've got more sort of um complex patients um with really sort of chronic diseases um, and when i reflected on it really um things like the respiratory um diseases that you know we're sort of in, increasing day by day um, I really sort of recognised that actually we were contributing to that. So we were almost creating more work as clinicians by the practice that we were doing. Um, so it just really made me stop and think that actually, you know, uh, that it, you know, we talk about climate change, we call, talk about environment um, a lot um, now, I think, within, you know, sort of um, industry and, and you see it on the news and, you know, all the time. But I think it's really just realizing that we you know it's our responsibility as well um and you know we can be a part of that and it doesn't have to be massive changes it can just be small changes in our practice um but i think just that knowledge behind us um as a nursing workforce and um, to stop and think about how you know if our practice is sustainable and and could we do things better will just really sort of help um, improve that really for you know for our family for our children and for you know for the future um, so yeah so if, if I haven't convinced you yet then please just really have a think about it um, and, um, and go and speak to Kate because she'll I'm sure she'll convince you as well. Thank you very much Karen I'm sure you've absolutely convinced everybody on the call that was so it's so interesting and so helpful to have a lived experience from someone who's speaking and has, has participated in the learning. And I certainly learned lots about your role as well. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our speakers. Um, I'm sure that you would agree there's something for everybody here. And as a registrant myself, coaching was new to me on a programme and it is quite unique, as Karen says. And um, I defy you not to enjoy it once you've stepped into coaching personally and professionally through your learning. It's exciting. So thank you for that, Karen. I learn uh, very much from my colleagues every day. So I'm just going to pause for a moment while I go through the chat. I think most questions have been answered. I've just seen one at the bottom there, but we can come to. But I was looking at some groupings of the questions, so I just wanted to clarify that these programmes are for any role in any healthcare working environment, whether you're working in the NHS, the third sector, independent sector, whether you're a nursing support worker, a registrant, whether you're a band nine executive nurse, anybody, it's where you see your CPD and where you feel you would like to and be able to study. So something for everybody. I'm just glancing at my notes, I made another note. Um, a few questions around, is this part of a full master's or a degree? No, these are standalone modules of 20 credits that you can go on to use for your future study. 
It is participatory learning for uh, revalidation for nursing associates and midwives and registrants because you will be working with other peers and stakeholders. You'll be learning together. You'll be doing independent and group work. So absolutely part of your 35 hours uh, revalidation um, every three years. You'll be pleased to know. So that's 12 weeks. Um, I'm just going to go back to the chat and see if we can answer any of the other questions. I think also what's important is please do have a look at the RCN Foundation Education and Research Grants. Members and non-members can apply for those. And again, they're for any role. There are lots of different um, awards you can apply to and there's guidance. So it might be the RCNF, but you can use that um, application if you're successful to an RCN programme. Um, it is quite underknown. We've promoted a lot, so do take the time. I've put the link a couple of times in the chat for, for you to access. Panel, have you got any thoughts or questions for um, the audience, please? Any more final comments? I'll, I'll just echo what you said about the RCM Foundation. I've just come to the end of eight years as a trustee for the Foundation. And one of the best things I've been able to do in that eight years is being able to dish out money for people to do courses like this. So please do go and have a look. It's straightforward to apply um, and, and, and it really is worthwhile. There's opportunities for everybody within those professional development grants. Thank you, Chris. And again, I too am lucky enough to be part of the assessment tests on the assessor panel on those. And we have people with really simple requests through to really complex learning needs. So um, please take a look. We'd, we'd really be pleased if you did. There's no um, more questions in the chat. So a huge thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you found it informative. We've certainly enjoyed talking through the programmes and answering your questions. Um, there's a final slide on the screen if you want to screenshot it at this stage. The links are in the chat, but the, um, there's further information on, on the slide in front of you. And remember, you will receive this recording in the weeks to come so you can revisit it. So thank you once again for coming along to the RCM webinar and thank you panel. Have a good evening.